Hey everybody, Greg here, and today is Friday, November 17th, 2017. This is a short video about a heating system that I developed using existing technologies, uh, just mashing them all together. Uh, there, so there was no work, you know, done in the lab with soldering irons and stuff. Uh, and, and because of that, you know, it's not something I can really sell because it's all open source or easily accessible to any consumer. But the, the mashing together of it is uh, pretty unique, which you're going to see in just a minute. So what I'm holding here right now is just um, a tablet computer. I can do this on my iPhone as well or from another computer or whatever. But you can access the heating system and you can see um, what the cost is to operate the heating system. And you can turn up the heat, you can adjust the fans, you can do all kinds of things. Uh, remotely with sort of essentially like an app, okay? Um, so, but before I get to the heating system, it's nice and cozy actually. I'm in Iowa, for those of you who don't know, I'm, I'm in Iowa City. It's, it's cold weather here now. We, the cold season started a month ago. It's going to go for quite a while. Um, and so even with the heat on sometimes, it's like not enough heat, right? So that's what got me kind of interested in developing sort of a heating system. But anyway, um, this is a traditional heater right? Just a little electric heater. You can use it to kind of boost the heat in a certain room or, uh, you know, if the room's small enough and you just want to run one of these, you can do that. Um, the cost to operate something like this, it, it's 1500 watts. So uh, the math is, you know, pretty straightforward. That's 1.5 kilowatts. Um, and I'll, I'll just bring it up so I'm reading you the right numbers. But yeah, 1.5 kilowatts per hour, so it's about 10 cents for most people, depending on where you're at paying for electric. Um, so 10 cents per kilowatt hour, and uh, that's 1.5, so that's 15 cents an hour. Not too bad. Um, by the end of the day, you know, if you're running it, usually you leave these little things running in the corner. So it's maybe like $3.60 a day, um, and then that adds up to about $108 a month. So, you know, that's, that's what this one will cost you. Um, and, you know, it's got a little fan in there, blows across these fins and, and kicks out some heat. You'll notice, though, when I unplug this heater, it stops running. So, the, uh, it needs to be plugged in, of course, right? Uh, so that's, that's pretty much that heater, and, um, so I'll just say to round it off, say 100 bucks a month, you know, is what it costs you to run that. And, 1500 watts. There you go. And obviously you, you can't get to this thing from your, uh, you know, iPhone. <laughs> so, all right. So moving on to this system, very similar, pretty much essentially the same fins, the same fan, um, but it's using a lot less electricity. So that's, that's the key. Using a lot less electricity. Ooh, nice warm heat coming out of there and it just keeps going. So I'm going to go look at the live numbers. And what I'm showing right now, let's see, we're currently using 9.13 kilowatt hours per day, so 90 cents a day, uh, about a dollar a day. So a third the cost, that's nice. Um, and so if we say a dollar a day, so $30 a month instead of $100 a month, pretty good deal, right? And the nice thing about this one is it's, there are modules inside, basically. So you add a module and um, it just kicks out more heat, the more modules you add. So you can scale it up, scale it down, whatever you want. You can put one in each room. There are a lot of folks living in smaller spaces right now. Uh, we have just in our city, you know, these condos that might be $300,000, you know, for a 500 square foot condo um, for people that don't have, you know, quarter million or a third of a million dollars sitting around, whatever it might be. Um, you know, there are people living in tiny houses, right? Smaller homes, either on wheels or just little cottages. So, so people are living in smaller spaces, which means heating now can be um, reimagined, okay? How we're gonna heat our homes. Um, so basically that's, that's what this is. So now we're talking about a dollar a day, $30 a month. Now what's interesting about this is uh, well, first of all, you saw I unplugged the other heater, it turned off. This, this heating system, you can unplug and it just keeps running, which is nice. In the wintertime in Iowa, sometimes with these ice storms, the lines break, you know. And so um, this one, you can just 
I put it on a cart. I like having it on a cart because I can move it around, you know, it's more efficient that way. I'll just kind of put it in whatever room I want it to be in. But, um, and you might say, well, that's magic. He's, you know, this heater's running and, and it's not plugged in. But I have just a standard UPS system, uninterruptible power supply. Now, that comes in handy for a few reasons, which I'm about to explain. But uh, <clears throat> basically, you want to have that UPS system there because it, it helps protect the system from surges. It helps provide continuous power. You get warmth and when the lights go out, right? So that's, that's good. Uh, but it also has this software so you can monitor how much energy you're using, how much electricity you're using, and it calculates right here your uh, actual cost per day and everything. It's, it's great. Um, and that again, as I said, I'm mashing up stuff that already exists. So that's, you can go to Staples, Best Buy or wherever, you know, get one of these uninterruptible power supplies. Um, and it uh, comes with the free software, so you know, basically that's kind of cool. And let's get into the, the workings of this little box here. What, what I didn't tell you at the outset of this video, because I think you probably wouldn't even have watched, because you wouldn't believe it, like I wouldn't believe it. This actually costs nothing to operate, okay? Um, that's that's kind of the amazing thing. Now, some of you are thinking, hey, I'm going to stop playing this video, because that can't this is unreal. How can it not cost anything to operate? Now I'm going to lose about half of you, okay? Not only does this not cost anything to operate, it actually generates more money than it, it costs to, to use. It, uh, this will generate about $100 a month, um, and the cost to operate is about, as I said, $30 a month, so a net earning of $60 a month. You're not going to quit your day job, right? But that's nice. So basically, it takes your electric bill from, you know, whatever, $80 a month. Your electric bill is now zero, or maybe it's negative. Like, you're going to make money and pay nothing in electricity by plugging this little box into your outlet. Um, and in fact, even when you unplug it, you're still making money, which I'm going to explain in a second. Again, mashing together stuff that already exists. So what's in here? You see there's no computer display, there's no keyboard, there's no mouse. It's just operated from remote access software, um, which is also free. And inside of here is basically just a regular computer running some software. The software is free. Uh, let me just turn this around so you can see. In the back here you have typical, you know, computer plugs, right? Video ports if you wanted to hook up a monitor. And um, as I turn it around here, you can see it's, it's essentially a, a fancy computer case. You can get these for you know, $100, $150, whatever, pretty much any computer case. What makes this unique, though, is that you don't need a lot of hard drives running. Uh, you're not going to have the clutter and cables of a keyboard and a mouse and a monitor. Um, it really just needs a very small, preferably solid state drive inside of there. And, and that's about it. So you really save a lot on the internal components because you, you don't need a lot of RAM either, which is nice. Um, so I'm just kind of working inward toward the, the sort of guts of the system and how this works. So basically you take a standard computer case, the UPS I've already mentioned. Inside here you just drop in a standard motherboard and you start putting in these different video cards. So that's why, that's why you want the larger case so you can get in two or three video cards. This one just has two video cards in it. That's nothing special. Um, and it's, as I said, generating about $100 a month, which I'm about to explain. So it's these, these uh, video cards which have very fine fins on them. A fan blows over those fins and generates a lot of heat. So, you know, basically, and they're super efficient. And so that's how come this costs a third to operate than a regular heater. Um, and the more heat, you know, if you want more heat, just put in more video cards. Th this is kicking out plenty of heat. Uh, my wife got home the other day and she, first thing she said was, it's hot in here, like the apartment had heated up, right? So uh, it generates a lot of heat. So you're getting heat from this very large heat sink here on the processor. Um, the fan blows through those fins and all these components generate heat. A lot of it. The faster it's running or the more you know work that the computer is doing, the more heat it generates. 
So what can you do to make a computer get really hot? All right, well, there's this new um, sort of a mesh distributed data network of computers. Now this has been done for a long time. There have been projects where somebody's you know, researching the human genome or whatever it might be, and then volunteers say, hey, yeah, you can use some of my computing power. Um, and so there's you know, thousands of people with their computers running and processing something, right? Well, oh, maybe you know, seven years ago, 10 years ago or more, um, there's been a project that involves uh, essentially banking, you know, uh, managing funds, which you need computers to keep track of um, transactions. And so um, you've, you've probably heard of like you know, Bitcoin or things like that. Uh, which be, in the beginning was, uh, and still is, pretty volatile in terms of its value um, and, and was not very well regarded or even accepted very broadly. Well now you can go to you know, Dell and buy a computer using Bitcoin. You can, you can go to mainstream uh, retailers are now accepting Bitcoin as a, a viable currency that they'll take payment in. So anyway, th those, that Bitcoin system requires uh, computers to process those transactions and there isn't necessarily you know an official central data center somewhere these are just like people with home computers or s some people make an investment in it they'll fill up a big data center with thousands of servers or computers doing mining of now it's not just bitcoin but uh, ethereum and litecoin and a bunch of other um, you know currencies that are e-currencies, essentially. Uh, mostly used on the internet, but you can also use them in shops. Uh, they're, you know, sandwich shops will take Bitcoin for a sub or whatever. So anyway, that processing has been distributed out. And with uh, systems like um, Ethereum, it's not just a, a monetary transaction system. You can actually write programs that run on that. So if you can imagine, it's, it's a a distributed network of computers processing these various requests that initially began as sort of financial transactions. This person gave that person ten dollars, um, but now it's developed into de you know writing software that runs on this, and it, it uses the, um, the the network to do that. So anyway, I don't want to go too deep into the details of that, but somebody needs to get paid for trans, you know, processing those transactions. In the past, it's been a data center. You send them you know, thousands of dollars to do all these you know, processes, right? But the way the new system works with programs and other things being written for distributed networks, that whatever, you know, million dollars that was going to Wall Street for processing things, now, or data centers, now that's going to uh, individuals whoever happens to be running this software. So the, the software is free. And essentially what's happening then is this heats up to generate heat. The, the way it heats up is by tasking the computer very heavily, you know, um, with this processing. And that generates about $3 a day um, because you're, you're paid basically on how much computing power you're providing to the network. Um, so what's exciting about this is you think about you know, millions and millions of homes in colder climates, either much of the year or all of the year, need heat. This is just one little heating box, right? But you could create a lot of these. Uh, there are people who are really into this thing called mining. You know, they'll, they'll get one motherboard and then have like eight video cards running off that one motherboard. Um, now, if you take it too far, you're going to generate so much heat that you can't really use it to heat your home, right? So this is, I think, kind of the sweet spot, is you're not getting specialized software. You're, you're using a computer that if you wanted to repurpose, you could use it for doing, you know, your whatever. You could just use your computer. But um, so it's, it's all, you know, hardware and equipment that's readily accessible, easy to buy, easy to put together, repurpose. You can repurpose it. Um, but in the time being, you know, if you're using it for this process, then it's generating revenue because you are essentially selling the compute cycles out to people who bid for those. Now, 
there are a lot of ways to do that, but the one that I've been using here, it's called Nice Hash. So um, basically you just go online with the free software, you get a, a very long string of letters and numbers that's your unique ID essentially. Um, it's, it's a Bitcoin address. And <clears throat> you tell the software that's what your account is, you know. So the computer as a node is doing all this computing processing for random requests that come in. Then uh, a payment comes into that account and uh, little teeny bits, you know, little bits, but a hundred bucks by the end of the month. And um, with NiceHash, essentially there's this list of people over here that say, hey, I want these tasks done, these processes computed. And they send that out to this group of people over here that has these computers sitting in their living room, right? Um, and they compute those processes. The neat thing about this also is if for some reason I were to turn it off or unplug Get, you know, it's not running, or if I just needed to shut it down, or whatever. Um, no harm, you know, I'm, I'm just one, there's one less person in this list over here processing things, but nothing's lost because it's all distributed, redundant uh, mesh network of, of computers over here, so any one person turning off their computer is not going to shut things down. Um, and it doesn't affect my, my earnings, you know, it just as soon as I turn it back on, I start earning money again, okay? And, um, it's a very neat system, and the software, this nice hash software, uh, doesn't need much of a computer to run on. It's mostly taxing the video cards that are in there, um, but uh, it, it's like a one-click install. I mean, it's it's very you know, this typical software installation wizard in Windows. It works great. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. The other thing that optimizes this is that with that nice hash software. It analyzes what video cards you have, what processor, what CPU, what GPU, the graphic processor <clears throat> you have, and um, it figures out what would be the best tasks to assign to this computer. Because each video card has a uh, capability of running certain processes more efficiently, more effectively. I could run some other process on here, but because of the particular hardware I have, if I'm just guessing at it, I'm probably not going to get $3 a day or the $100 a month. I might just end up with $70 a month or whatever, you know. So by using that free NiceHash software, it um, optimizes this piece of hardware for the maximum profit. Not only that, but goes and finds bidders who are saying, hey, I really want this job done right away. And so you kind of get the highest dollar for the market. Um, so there are kind of two things going on at the same time. The, the most simple way of thinking about it is it's just a nice little heater that even if you weren't making any money off of it, it would still cost a third of what your regular heater costs to operate, right? Um, but the fact that it has that capability of making money. Now, I don't see this going anywhere, uh, going away, I guess I would say, uh, anytime soon because there's, there's a growing need for this distributive uh, mesh type of a network for, for data and processing. Uh, of information due to just you know numerous disruptions right whether it's uh, flooding or fires or earthquakes or you know hurricanes massive you know wiping out entire areas and wars and stuff so you've got a lot of disruption going on and so in order to keep uh, a global network going you need to have sort of this it's a blockchain technology these very uh, encrypted very secure uh, bits of information that are that are creating these logs and um, <clears throat> yeah you know it uh, there's going to be a need for that um, and the fact that it's using standardized hardware you know I mean yeah anybody can just drive out to the store and get a video card drop it in start running the software you know get two or three cards in there and you're making like a hundred dollars or more um, per month and like I say there are people you get 10 of these, well, then you're making $1,000 a month. I, I know that it starts to sound like, wow, is that possible? But yeah, you know, you get 10 of these, or if you want to make, what, 4000 a month, you get 40 of them. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, like I said, I, I find just the, the least investment of time and money, um, and the greatest return is just to have, like, one of these little boxes running, or one per room, just kind of heat things up in the wintertime. And then in the summertime, just, you know, put it in a room where you don't mind if it gets a little warm in there. Um, but uh, anyway, I, I thought that uh, thought that you'd find this interesting, and um, you know, if if you want to learn more about it.
basically you just you know jump online I'll, I'll give you a list right now of what these components are uninterruptible power supply just jump over to your favorite online <coughs> store probably Amazon right um, or you know go to your local vendor for these and uh, that's that the video cards I like are by um, EVGA I like those just because they come with some good software and if I have the same uh, EVGA cards in the computer then the, the software works with all the cards I'm not mixing and matching different cards I thought about building up another box that would have different video cards that would work with different processes better it'd just be interesting to see if somehow there'd be more money in that or something but um, anyway yeah so you know uh, you get yourself some video cards and then a basic computer I mean, you know, this would also work with kind of an out-of-the-box um, gaming computer although with that you'd be paying probably more money for some you know flashing little neon lights or something in there uh, but that's basically it and you can look up nice hash let me explain also to use that this nice hash account that you don't even really need like uh, to a fancy account it's just like your name and your email address to you to set that up and uh, you get a what's called a, a wallet a Bitcoin wallet um, by setting that up but you need to have some sort of other mechanism for getting your money out of that and you can do that uh, well every time you generate you know a few dollars they pay you so you can just get cash every few hours if you want or you know transfer it out once a week whatever you want to do but um, anyway uh, the this nice hash would work with something like uh, a popular one is Coinbase, and with Coinbase, um, that's what turns uh, these Bitcoin monies into basically cash. You can, like I said, go to Dell, go to a lot of online vendors; they'll take Bitcoin as a payment. Um, and they also have Ethereum and Litecoin, so they have these three popular ones through Coinbase. You can put money into it if you want, pay cash for, if you want to buy Bitcoin, you know. Uh, there are a lot of vendors that give discounts, like might be 5%, 10% discount if you're paying with Bitcoin, because they don't have any processing fees. They don't have um, the, the large processing fees of a credit card company. Uh, so anyway, Coinbase.com. And that then you would set up with a credit card or your bank or whatever and you could transfer money back and forth it also helps you if somebody wants to pay you in Bitcoin then you're able to receive that and put it into your bank account you know um, so but anyway I I just wanted to give you a rundown of that how it's interesting to mesh this together and the idea that you know with distributed uh, computing that for anyone who wants to you know invest in something like this they can do that at any scale they want. You know, you can just go out and buy yourself a $150 video card or, uh, oh, and I should explain that interesting thing with these video cards. So there's a card that's like $150. That's this one here. It's the GTX 1050 Ti. In 10 months, that's going to generate, that card will generate about $150. So you'll, you'll make your money back at $150 on this video card. Um, and after that, like by the end of a year, you'll make, uh, you know, another 30 bucks, $180. So basically you'll, in a year's time, for what you'll spend on this, um, you'll get about 20% return on your money. That, that's why people are investing in these huge, you know, personal data centers where they're filling up rooms with computers. It's because, you know, you, you put $1,000 in and by the end of the year, you've got 1200 bucks and... And then it just keeps going like your initial expense then is gone so you now you have no ongoing expenses and then all that money that's coming in is just revenue um, but uh, the, the neat thing about it is that you know the, the movement right now and i'm going to let this video go a little longer for those who are interested right but more of the philosophy behind this um, there's a trend right now in urban planning where we've been looking at urban centers and seeing you know, there's a whole bunch of people living over here and then they go to this uh, industrial park or they go to the business park or they you know when they go to work and then the people from these places they go to shop over here at this mall and and they're all driving around on highways and you don't get to know anybody right when you want 70 miles an hour you, it's it's just not a good situation so current day what what planners are doing right now when they're developing cities is they're saying hey let's let's put like some stores here 
and some offices right in here and some apartments or condos or homes over here and it's all kind of in a close space so now you're not driving at 70 miles an hour you're walking your you know walk into work five blocks or whatever distance you want to live from work but you're seeing the same people every day you get to know people it starts to build community you're going to the same shops it's a it's a better way to live you know so um, bringing all that in here so the same is true for you know as I was saying earlier these data centers it used to be all oh, the big data centers are over here and you got a bunch of people over here using these data centers um, and it really makes sense to bring the data center into where folks live, you know? When you go to use your, I have, you know, the iPad here or an iPhone, you think, oh, it's such a nice device. It only uses five watts. It's so quiet and sleek and amazing. Um, but actually, you know, all these electronic devices use data centers. If you were to have to, you know, really carry around and pay for the cost of your mobile device, it, it would be maybe something this size or maybe bigger, you know? And you'd have that fan noise all the time or whatever, you know, and the electricity used to run these things is, it's a, it's a big deal, you know? Um, so even when you can turn your smartphone off, it's still using electricity. You know why? Because your stuff's in the cloud. So somewhere there's a computer running and backing up and transferring data and all this is happening because you, for every single smart device out there, um, and, and anything that has an account, you know, your smart TV, anything that has an account where you log in and there's some data there, that has to be maintained somewhere. Uh, right now, we're pushing it out to the suburbs or wherever these data centers are where we don't have to see them, you know. But I, I sort of like the idea of, um, actually, it's sort of like people like gardening and, and growing their own food, you know, like in their backyard. It's, you really become, to become connected with the source of the things that you rely on to live on daily, you know. So this is the same kind of thing, is that you're, you're becoming part of this larger collective global data center, and it makes you more aware of, oh, okay, so yeah, this takes electricity, and, but there's value to it, and so, you know. Um, so I just think that's kind of neat. And, you know, if, if it got to the point where there was enough revenue generated, um, a lot of people could have these types of systems at home, and it could be a partial source of income, or maybe if they had enough of them, a full source of income. Um, so, things to think about, but I wanted to show you this, this uh, you know, proof of concept essentially. And I think it's neat because it's hardware and software that people can just put together on their own with a relatively limited budget, and then it's scalable. Um, so, I'd, I'd like to hear any comments, suggestions, questions that you have. And I thought you'd want to see the software that is running behind this heating system that I was describing. So I have it on screen here. And in the top left side, you see kind of the power usage. Down below, uh, you see the sort of dollars generated in revenue. Right now it says $3.45, now $2.88. So that's going to fluctuate. Um, but now it's back up to $3.47. The average probably is around $3 a day, and you can see that if you log into your NiceHash.com uh, account, you can see what the daily revenue is that's being generated. But let's um, take a closer look uh, up here. <laughs> I'm going to be piecing these videos together. Um, but yeah, up here where you'll see the APC software. It's free software. It comes with the uninterruptible power supply. Uh, the UPS, APC is American Power Conversion. They're different brands. They all come with their own free software to kind of monitor your power quality, if there are any power outages. Uh, depending on how much power you're using, how, how much time can you run on the battery? And if you want more uptime, you just buy more of these batteries, essentially. But um, here you can see it's based on about $0.09 cents, uh, per kilowatt hour, and it's going to cost... Uh, about 90 cents per day um, and then it also shows us our carbon output which is a factor anytime we're using something that requires electricity so um, basically about a dollar a day let's say and then down below you can see hovering around you know three dollars a day being generated and really what's what's creating this money is that people have processing tasks that need to be done and they're willing to pay money uh, based on sort of the market value of processing power. And video cards have a lot of processing power, so they have value. 
And as I mentioned, you can buy a video card that might cost, say, $150. It's going to generate about $150 in, say, 10 months. So by the end of a year, you'll make, you know, 20% on your money. Um, now, people do this in large scale, right? And you might think, wow, I could just make all kinds of money, right? You know, just get uh, 100 of these computers. And yes, you would make a lot of money. Um, so instead of making, you know, $100 a month, you'd make... Uh, thousand dollars a month or ten thousand a month but the deal is like once you get to that scale now you are going to need like an air conditioning system and a diesel generator to be running and you're going to have to start hiring staff people and have an hr department so that's what what we call a data center you know so on the smaller scale though what's kind of nice is you get so many opportunities and efficiencies because of that small scale you don't need to hire staff you don't need to install some industrial air conditioning system. It's just like a few computers around the house or whatever. So um, anyway, then, yeah, on the right, you'll see the uh, processes that are, you know, running. And it, essentially, that's what you're getting paid for is running all those processes. And then below, the process up above is the Equihash process. And so I can go down into mining details and I can see that the video cards, um, both combined, those video cards are running this Equihash process and it's achieving about 400 and over 400 uh, megahash per second, which is, uh, I'm sorry, hash per second, 400. Yeah. Um, anyway, and uh, so that's the, the power of those combined. And then the processor up there is running a task and it's getting about 250 or something so about half the the capability of those video cards um the cpu i should mention it's an eight core it's a really nice fast cpu in this computer so that's why i told it to run that and and generate a little extra revenue there but i'll click back and uh, to the main screen you can log in to your nicehash.com user account you can get all of your daily details and, and the money that's getting paid out. And it's, it's real dollars um, that, well, it's, it's, it's in electric cur currency. Uh, it's a Bitcoin. But, you know, you, you go to a, a website, like I mentioned, uh, Coinbase or whatever, and you can turn that into dollars. So it's, it's not like some imaginary play money in some world that you can't use anywhere. Um, and, and more and more, as I mentioned, you know, people sandwich shops and Dell computer or whoever mainstream businesses are accepting Bitcoin. So if you want, you can either convert it to cash or just use it directly as Bitcoin. Um, but yeah, that's that's basically it. And I, I wanted to give a little detail on this is I'm going to stop the processing here and go into um, here about the hardware details. There's a little on off switch to the left of each item. So I can run just one video card if I want I can kick it up to two video cards, get the CPU in there. I'm going to drop another video card in today just to uh, max out this particular box. But um, basically, however many video cards you have running, that's how much heat you're going to generate. And it costs a little more in electricity, but it's generating much more in terms of revenue. So it, it's a sweet spot there. You know, if you had an older computer with an older video card, it's probably going to use more power and electric. Uh, there's going to be more cost there than it's able to generate. But these new video cards, they use quite a bit less in terms of power, and they really have a lot of processing power. They're really, many of them, faster than a normal computer, all on a little card. They have, one of these cards has six gigabytes of RAM. It's DDR5 RAM, so it's, it's faster memory than is in most computers. And it's just really amazing what it can do so um, yeah there I wanted to explain that so that's kind of how you turn that fan on and off and, and kick out more heat is by basically engaging more processing power and tasks now I, since I turned it off you'll notice now we're down to 46 cents a day instead of that dollar per day um, and when I turn this back on there we go now the processes start running again, the money starts coming in again, uh, and the money goes out in terms of paying for electricity. But, um, you know, basically now, get that back in there. Yeah, 
Now, now we're back up to sort of 90 cents a day on the electric and up to $3.08 a day uh, in terms of revenue, $3.25. So as I mentioned, that number jumps around a little bit. But uh, but that, that's the software. And you can just kind of set it and forget it if you want. You know, just let this thing sit in a corner and run and just, you know, collect your $100 a month or whatever you're generating. Um, you, it is a good idea. This might be common sense, but I'll, I'll mention anyways. To go ahead and close out of any unnecessary programs because they all take processing power away from the task that, that's needed. And, and I mentioned this earlier briefly, but these are really simple computers in the sense that you don't have a lot of hard drives in there. It's not for file sharing. You're not hooking up printers, displays, anything. It's like the most basic computer without a monitor or anything. No extra software, right? You don't want to load this thing up with a bunch of software. Other than the basic Windows antivirus software, which is fine, um, you're not checking emails on here. You're not, you know, surfing the web. So you're not going to run into any viruses, hopefully. But it, it will have some security measures built into Windows anyway. But the point is, <clears throat> you turn off as much of that as possible so that the only task running is the, uh, the processing of these tasks that you're getting paid for. Um, and even the remote access is going to slow it down a little bit, the software I'm using to remotely check in on it. So you don't even really, uh, there's no reason to leave that running all the time. So you can kind of, you know, just close out of that. Um, oh, I also will just make a note here that um, there's some software here for checking your system temperature, your fan speeds, all of that stuff. I have that installed. Here's the team viewer icon, but otherwise a real clean desktop. There's nice hash too. And there's also a legacy nice hash, which I might end up using on an older computer I have. It works with some AMD video cards, but the newer version, which is really this nicer intelligent version, um, it will only work with certain video cards and, and not AMD as I understand it. It does an initial hardware assessment. So if there's some hardware that it's not going to make use of, it sees it, it just isn't going to use it. You're not going to get paid for sharing out the processing of that. So, well, that's about it. Hey, thanks for watching. Curious to know if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions. Always appreciate those, and I'll see you in the next video. Hey everybody, Greg here. Thanks for watching my little video about creating your own DIY home heating system using essentially video cards and a computer uh, combined with currency, um, you know, cryptocurrency creation, uh, which is a way to kind of offset the cost of having the computer running, heating your home. Um, that's a real simple concept and it meshes together some readily accessible technologies I took some time to kind of reflect on the topic of this video before posting it. I created it on November 17th. Back then, Bitcoin uh, had what I thought peaked out at like $7,000. It had gone up from not too long ago. It was at $4,000. Well, then it went in the last two weeks from seven to eight to nine to 10. And then just at uh, Yesterday, I think it was, you know, it, it peaked out at like $11,000 value per Bitcoin. So I'm kind of glad I waited to post my video about the home heating system because the numbers have all changed, you know. Um, I was saying it might take 10 months to recoup your costs. Well, with the value of Bitcoin having, you know, increased by about 50%, um, these little heating systems I described can start generating a lot more money because they're essentially working within this realm of cryptocurrency where you get paid in Bitcoin. So you're getting paid in a currency that's worth much more. Um, but you know, part, part of the reason I wanted to hold off and, and think about, you know, do I even really want to pr promote and post this video is because, you know, you've, you've heard these stories, I've heard stories on YouTube, there'll be somebody who's created a car that goes 200 miles, gets 200 miles per gallon. Um, or just, you know, these amazing inventions, right? And then you never hear from those people again, like they just disappear, you know? Um, and so I, I was thinking like, you know, if, if there's this way to create a home heating system or a heating system for a business or factory or whatever, and essentially you're, you're creating a data center that's generating all this heat and you're using that to heat your home, um, that could really be kind of a disruptive technology and there are people probably that you know, wouldn't want that to happen or they, they'd want to for some reason suppress that, but I'm not 
a conspiracy theorist, I just thought, you know, maybe somebody would be uh, not so pleased by that bit of news. Um, also, I thought, you know, I, I don't want somebody to go out and put a patent on this and then suddenly nobody else can, can you know, work with this technology that is essentially, as I say, DIY and open source, you know, sort of like Monsanto trying to own everybody's seed corn in the world, you know. Um, so I, I like the idea of being, people being able to do this at home on their own, you know, go to the store, grab some parts and throw them together and you've got your home heater uh, that's, that's generating money for you. Um, so I was a little concerned about that and thinking through that. Uh, and, and then also just the fact of, you know, there's this great idea, which I'm sure other people have had, you know. Um, it's obvious externality of having computers is the heat and somebody must have thought, hey, that's a great way to heat your home, maybe, I don't know. But um, anyway, that as people start to realize, hey, you could make a lot of money and there are these other benefits of having these computers sitting at home running, um, that there would be a market shortage, right, of video cards and other components required to make this happen. So um, that was two weeks ago. You know, I went back to get some more video cards because I'm doing my own sort of proof of concept on this and, and putting some systems together. And uh, I, I started, you know, going back to these websites to buy more video cards and they would be sold out. Or like one source said, you know, limit of five per household. Um, and then I went to buy the five because I thought there's going to be like this nationwide shortage of, of these video cards. This particular one is like really low cost, really low power to operate and produces a lot of revenue. So uh, I thought I'm going to buy five of these. Well, then I got to the checkout and it said, we're sorry, our limited inventory only allows you to buy one. So I'm like, wow. And then I, I went to our local store and I bought one and uh, it was the last one. It's the last one in 250 miles. I went back again today to check and these are being sold out nationwide. Amazon doesn't even have them. People are marking up the prices on these video cards. This component that I was telling you you can get and put in this computer to heat your home, well, people are starting to realize that there's a market now for these because the price of Bitcoin has kind of you know, doubled and quadrupled in recent months. Um, the value of these cards has really gone up. Their functional practical use value has gone up because all you got to do is buy one, pop it in, run this free software, and you're making money, okay? So um, people are selling these on eBay. I've seen some of these cards that should be selling for 150 bucks um, are listed by people who are selling them used or whatever, uh, reselling them for $300 or more. Uh, and some of the higher end cards are now like $800, $1,000 uh, for a video card. Some of them that, you know, have a lot more computing power, but, um, you know, people are not going to have the money to go out and start buying $1,000 video cards. The nice kind of sweet spot would be these cards that are like $150 to $200 that, again, are low power usage, have some really good um, processing power. So anyway, that was the third reason I didn't really want to just kind of rush to do this. I thought even for myself, I'd like to even at least be able to buy a few cards before they're no longer available nationwide. Um, so I can just kind of have fun with this and test it out and then, you know, share the video. Um, and, and I'm not going to go into a long story now, but it kind of made me reflect a little bit on some of the other content that I share that might be tips and tricks and little insights and little inventions and projects and things that um, I'm not patenting. I'm not you know, putting a copyright on things. I'm, I'm giving them free for public use, you know. Um, my hope is that, uh, you know, it's the people that are out there that kind of want to make the world a better place and, and be nice to people. You know, those are the people that are benefiting from this, that are profiting from this. Um, but when there's scarcity, you know, it, it makes a person think, wow, you know, um, maybe the scarce resources should go to people who are like trying to have a positive impact in the world and not to the villains that are out there, you know, who knows. Um, and, and some things have also happened with Bitcoin, just to go on a little more about this, is that it's, I won't say recently become disclosed, but it's become more and more uh, public knowledge that there's a handful of people right now, because they started early in Bitcoin and invested back then kind of heavily, they are now millionaires and billionaires. So not because of any particular um, effort that they put into it, not because they, 
they took a test and the test showed that they were a really good person. You know, it's just like random people who've become really multi-billionaires in a very short period of time that now have an incredible amount of power. And those who are kind of getting into Bitcoin now, you know, maybe the days of making millions of dollars are over, I don't know, you know, depending on how much you invest in it. Um, but certainly, you know, the, the increases we've seen from before going from its value of, say, even just a year ago or more, you know, $400 Bitcoin and then up to 4000 um, you know, almost a year later and now it's up to like 10000 9000 uh, that initial jump, I don't think we're going to keep seeing a linear growth. I think we're going to see some ups and downs. Uh, may, maybe in another year it'll be worth 40000 per Bitcoin. Who knows? Um, and uh, But it seemed to me that overall, the whole cryptocurrency thing, it it sort of favors the lucky, you know? I mean, it really doesn't favor anybody in particular, but it's kind of a roll of the dice, you know? Whoever decided, hey, I'm gonna, there was one guy who was saying he invested 25,000 back when Bitcoin was worth like a few bucks or something, you know? Um, those people are gonna be millionaires and they might be good people who wanna make good things happen in the world, but they also might be, I don't know, could be mafia, could be organized crime, could be whoever. So, you know, it's kind of a mixed bag. So I don't see Bitcoin as this, cryptocurrency solution that's going to really level the playing field for everybody it just shifts you know the billionaires from years ago are being exchanged for the new billionaires of today um, and we still don't have equity you know and people that had the money that had a lot of money to risk and invest in Bitcoin um, made a lot of money but again not necessarily those who are the most altruistic it's just whoever happened to do it um, and so I guess my, my reservation about Bitcoin in that sense is just that, yeah, it's, it's not going to be some kind of solution to make the world a more equitable place necessarily unless these early adopters decide to start redistributing the wealth or, you know, building schools and clinics and farms or something. Um, and, and just my second concern about it is that the, the same concern people have had about the dollar or any currency, you know, if it's backed by something well then you know that that little piece of paper actually has some tangible value that you know you can any, at any time exchange your little piece of paper for gold or for some valuable uh, asset and uh, but you know the dollar's not really backed by gold and and Bitcoin isn't really backed by anything Bitcoin uh, it's, it's just a digital currency which has got the same value as a paper currency you know so what I would really like to see is rather than people spending literally thousands of dollars every month sometimes in some cases with these um, you know cryptocurrency mining rigs people are spending thousands of dollars a month on hardware on this equipment lots of time is going into it lots of you know electricity is getting used huge carbon footprint for this happening uh, it's, it's data processing it has to be done somewhere but still I mean there's just some considerations there rather than doing that I'd like to see our economy and this is kind of high-level talk here, but I'd like to see our economy shift more toward activities and currencies that are of value, okay? So, um, you know, it's fun to like go to a drag race and you see the dragster go down the strip or, you know, some people like to take a jet airplane out just for the fun of it. All that fuel that's getting burned, it's not coming back. It's not like you built something and that thing you built is going to start creating revenue. Um, there, there are a lot of activities like watching fireworks. I love to watch fireworks, but there again, that's just money getting burned up, you know, there's, or war or anything else or drugs, you know, there's, there's lots of stuff where money just dissipates and it's never coming back. And money is sort of energy, uh, it's resources. And so, you know, millions of dollars spent on things that just, that, that don't continue to produce wealth and well-being back to humanity, I think need to be kind of reflected upon, you know? So, in the same way that people have argued that, you know, the dollar should have uh, be backed by, say, an equivalent in gold. Well, we could have a currency that's backed by food, shelter, water, and somehow clean air, you know, uh, and maybe combined with, like, farming, agriculture, um, community-supported agriculture, CSAs, you know, something like that. To me, I would feel more assured if I had thousand dollars in some currency that's backed by 
a diversified portfolio of stuff that people actually need to live, right? That's totally different than being backed by even like gold. I mean, I can't eat gold, you know? Uh, maybe if you're making some computer parts and you need gold, then it has value there, but it's not the same direct value literally that like food has or that homes have. Um, and I don't know who's gonna do that, but I, I would like to see that happen, you know, that, that there'd be a currency that we'd start to focus our energy and our attention on rather than building up computers, why don't we build up farms or build up homes or build up other things that support life, not only today, but tomorrow and on down the road, you know? So I'm, I'm getting into this whole cryptocurrency because I find it interesting, I wanna learn more. There's an opportunity to make some money a little bit, but my focus I think is gonna continue to be on those things that, as I say, provide wealth and value back to humanity in the short term and long term rather than these kind of um, short term opportunities that come along uh, and I've seen some YouTube videos of people that are just investing like you know eighty thousand dollars in a mining rig system uh, that's generating say six thousand dollars a month uh, they'll they'll get a payoff in a little over a year or maybe less if if the values go up but um, that's just a huge investment in, in like one sector that there could be a bubble, you know, who knows? And is that going to happen in a month from now, a year from now? Maybe it won't happen. And just to conclude the video, to touch on that, people, there's been speculation about how much higher will Bitcoin go? Will it in fact maybe quadruple between now and next, you know, if you put in a million dollars today, will you have four million next year? Who knows? Um, I do think with cryptocurrencies like Ethereum, which is really not even a cryptocurrency, and this kind of brings everything full circle, full circle back around to what I was talking about in my video, is that there is a need for computing. Even your little smartphone that you have, you know, you can turn that off, it's still using electricity. Why? Well, because there's a data center somewhere that's got to keep your synchronized data that's in the cloud, and so you could turn off your phone, you could you know, throw it in a dumpster for per perpetuity, forever. It's gonna be using electricity until you like shut down all your accounts and stuff, but there's just data out there. There's the infrastructure of data. So data processing needs to be done. And Ethereum, kind of like Bitcoin, um, its price is going up. It's right around, I think, three, 400, something like that. And it's, I would guess, gonna climb. Ethereum is a development platform. You can write programs on it. So I think this trend toward distributive computing, people having like mini data centers at home, that that can be an investment for people. I think that'll probably always be around. I think we're gonna see a lot of ups and downs in the overall in cryptocurrency, but I, I think in general, this idea of investing a little bit of money in some computers, no specialized equipment. Hey, if everything goes bust, you know, you, you've got four computers sitting around that you can sell or give away or whatever. You've not invested a lot of money. So thanks again for watching. Comments, questions, suggestions, always appreciated. Have a great day.